The problem with getting older is that nostalgia isn't what it used to be. When I was young, nostalgia meant people talking about the 60s and 70s, of things like Pong and tic-tac-toe running on mainframe systems. Or perhaps the Apple II or BBC Micro if the conversation continued longer than a minute. Of programming games in BASIC by copying commands out of magazines, or maybe a discussion about tapes and punch cards. Now, while like many of you, I grew up in a time where I used text-only operating systems, the prevailing memories of the past are graphical. With just four years of my life operating a BASIC system back when they were still called microcomputers, and a further three years after alternating between DOS and Windows. With the passage of time, the Overton window shifts. As an increasing number of the population talk about their nostalgic memories in place of the old fuddy-duddies, who become an increasingly rare breed. Partly from dying off, partly from lack of engagement in popular discourse, and partly because of the boom in the popularity of computing that came after their time. If you go to Steam and look up the classic tag, you'll find games running the gamut between the 80s and more modern times. Which makes sense, as time is always ticking, but it's what constitutes these modern times that's most surprising. Star Wars Battlefront 2 is an arena-based shooter and was well received upon release. You could definitely see an argument being made for its inclusion into the classic tag at some point in the future, except it's already there. This game came out in 2005. Most of the people watching my channel devoted to classic games were already adults at this point, or close to it. And if I did a spotlight video on it, people would probably be confused. Halo 4 is also tagged as a classic because it's part of a Master Chief collection, whose earliest game is admittedly from 2001 and actually has a spotlight video from yours truly. However, this collection mostly consists of titles from 2007 to 2010, with the fourth iteration coming out as late as 2012. That was only 10 to 15 years ago, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It also throws us back to Moore's Law a topic I've discussed in the past. Moore's Law is the observation that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles about every two years. This means that the computing world is speeding along at a more rapid rate than certain other things. Take Prometheus, and cinema in general as an example. It was a Ridley Scott movie that also came out in 2012. I haven't heard people calling 2012 movie releases classics yet, but films like Alien, Blade Runner, and even Gladiator most definitely are. Judging from the youth of today on various social media sites, it's not going to be long before that happens though. With gaming, it already has. For me, the cutoff point of modernity was 2007 onward. You know, when the iPhone appeared, everything gaming went widescreen and the internet became mobile and everyone and their mum logged on to social media. So what, Lonnie? Why is this arbitrary cutoff point so important? Because as those who remember the before times shuffle off their mortal coil or simply stop interacting with their younger cohorts, the pieces of media they so fondly venerated will slowly sink into obscurity. Save for a few standout examples. Because they're overwhelmingly outnumbered by people who may well have never owned a computer before, that appeared online during the digital boom. Which made Eternal September, which was coincidentally when I appeared, seem like a minor quibble. The result? Candy Crush and The Sims 4 are considered classics by some people. Now, whether they actually are is certainly up for debate, but who are we to judge? There's ten times as many people who'll shout us down anyway. And therein lies the danger. Because of forum sliding and marketing of new material and other, less intentional ways of reducing discourse about games from a time long past. Much like how many people still know who Mo Howard is, but have no knowledge of Joe Smith from Smith & Deal. Thankfully, there are several specific niche websites that keep alive that past and dedicated efforts from communities and teams to preserve it. But the engagement in these places will eventually peak, and then gradually peter out. And it's not just a demographic matter either. There's an innate psychological need for many human beings to want to experience the best things in life. Most people don't want to be told that the cool new musician or play or book that they're enjoying actually isn't as good as the one that came out 20 years prior. 
especially younger people who are growing as individuals and find contemporaneous media that speaks to them. You want to believe that greater things are yet to come, that the new hotness is better than the crusty old stuff your parents or teachers enjoyed. And for a long time that was the case, thanks to improved production methods, and better scripting and acting and new frontiers being explored. But there's a growing sentiment among not just the older generations, but the youth today, that the best has been and gone, that we've peaked as a society, and that in many cases modern efforts aren't reaching the previous high standards of yesteryear. You see it in the dissatisfaction of recent media releases across the board. And there's a burgeoning market of cultural veneration that keen capitalism-focused companies are exploiting for money. What used to be occasional cherry-picking of highlights of the past is becoming more extensive. There are benefits to this too, like getting to enjoy the Super Deluxe Anniversary Remastered Definitive Collector's Gold Edition. Now the classics that were hamstrung by technological and production issues can be reappraised as not only classics, but landmark releases that are better than whatever new material the same content publisher could muster. After all, why take the gamble on something new that's untested after being burned over and over again when you can experience something that has been heavily vetted and has stood the test of time? With artistic ground heavily travelled upon by their predecessors, there's less opportunities for creators to produce something pioneering. It still happens, but the bulk of titles coming out in the 20s aren't anything new and will inevitably get compared to whoever did it best before. There's a memorable scene in The Simpsons during their famous B-Sharps episode that sums up this phenomenon quite nicely. When a limo stops, a window rolls down, George Harrison observes Homer's rooftop performance and states, it's been done. And that's why when so many gamers boot up their latest shiny new title, they don't find themselves enjoying it anywhere near as much as they thought they would. They're chasing a high and it's eluding them because they've seen it all before, but done better. Or at least so similar as to not make a difference. This constant revision of older titles to keep up with modern expectations has only just begun when compared to the likes of the older music, film and literature industries. But more and more games are getting that treatment. Or just having their old characters given new adventures. Speaking of old characters and new adventures, let's talk about Star Trek. The Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Unification, that aired in 1991 was one of the most watched in the series history because of the return of Leonard Nimoy, reprising his role as Spock for one of the last times. Then Spock turned up again in his 60s for The Undiscovered Country, and while the sixth film of the series was well received, there were plenty of jokes made about how old the crew were getting. So Nimoy sailed off into a sea of stars in the annals of history only to be brought back in 2009, 18 years later and played by Nimoy, Jacob Cogan and Zachary Quinto. Then again in The Disastrous Into Darkness and a third time in Beyond, after Nimoy's death. Then Ethan Peck came onto the scene and portrayed Spock and Discovery and Short Treks and Strange New Worlds. What was once a unique and interesting character has now turned into a glorified superhero, portrayed by almost a dozen different actors through nine movies and five different TV series of varying quality. And it's the varying quality part, combined with the overuse of the character, that has turned a Spock appearance in Star Trek from must watch to, oh, this again. The Vulcan is no longer a marquee draw despite being one of the greatest characters in fiction. And just like the danger of eventually being forgotten about altogether, there also lies the danger of the opposite. When a character is flanderized or altered beyond recognition in an attempt to have them used as a marketing tool, just ask Homer Simpson. And that's why nostalgia isn't what it used to be. Because so many of the memories you cherish from enjoying content of the past have been tainted through association with modern attempts to cash in on that image. It's also why preservation is so important, of both the original concept and whatever enhanced version can be produced with the tools of the future, so that we may remember the past and learn from it, rather than exploit its image for future gains. 
That way, no matter what the rights holders to various media properties may do with the characters you love, you'll always have the originals to return to. And if you like me talking about nostalgia, I have a whole channel full of it! Feel free to take a look at my scripted playlist over there, and if you like what you see, subscription is an option. Until next time.